and thanks for all coming along. I'm uh, excited to be here, um, particularly because, well, I, I feel like I know a lot about elections in Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea. I know a lot less about the electoral integrity as it is studied the world over. And so it's a, a sort of pleasure and a privilege to be here at the Electoral Integrity Project part of the University of Sydney where, where you guys specialise in studying elections internationally. And, and I'm going to tell you a tale today about electoral integrity in Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea. Uh, and what I'm really interested in hearing afterwards is your feedback on the similarities and differences uh, between what I'm about to talk about and the countries that you're familiar with or what you know from the international literature. And what I'm going to do is I talk about the quality of elections in, in Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea. I'm going to advance the argument that the quality of elections that these two countries experience is a product of three distinct but overlapping different political economies. The first of these is the political economy of the, na of the nation state, or of two countries' states, uh, and it's a political economy that provides little by way of incentive for political actors to run elections well. And uh, this, in turn, leads to decay or deterioration in the quality of elections in the two countries. On the other hand, there's a, another, but it interacts with a second political economy, which is an international political economy, one in which aid actors are afforded some element of uh, ability, some, some ability to act as a countervailing power, to push against the deterioration of electoral policy in the two countries. However, there are important constraints on the power that aid agencies can exert in this area. And then the third political economy I'm going to speak about might more accurately be ascribed as hundreds of or thousands of different local level political economies where poor electoral quality at the national level provides a lot of space for local level political actors to engage in electoral mis uh, malpractice. Um, although intriguingly, sometimes local level actors are constrained in what they can get away with by uh, the actions of other actors and, and sort of balance of power issues. Uh, and this can uh, often lead to surprisingly good uh, electoral quality outcomes in, in areas where we might not anticipate them to be. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cover all this very quickly right now. But there is a working paper that I see some of you have in your possession. Uh, and that goes into it in a lot more depth. And obviously, in discussion, we can talk about this much more too. Before I go any further, uh, seeing as I'm already banding around some terms, I, I better offer a couple of definitions. The first of these is that when I talk about electoral malpractice today, I'm talking about the breaking of formal rules, formal electoral rules for the purpose of gaining electoral advantage. And when I talk about electoral quality, I mean the extent to which electoral malpractice is absent or present. And then, uh, when I talk about political economy, or our political economy, what I mean is the balance of power within a particular arena of contestation. Uh, a balance that is both a product of and reflected in politics, the ability to coerce economic resources, and the use of both formal and informal institutions to enable collective action. So I know there are a range of different definitions of political economy out there, but when I'm using the term, that's what I mean. The other thing I need to do before I go too far into talking about elections themselves is to provide you with some country context. So Solomon Islands and, and Papua New Guinea are two of Australia's closest neighbours. Here we see the Northern Territory, there's Papua New Guinea, Port Moresby as capital, here's Honiara, uh, Solomon Islands with Honiara as its capital. So they're two of Australia's closest neighbours, they're also two of the poorest countries in the Pacific. Solomon Islands uh, purchasing power parity adjusted GNI per capita is very similar to that of Afghanistan. Papua New Guinea's meanwhile is in the vicinity of Tajikistan and Cameroon. Um, and they're both poorly governed countries too. On the World Bank's uh, government effective measure, their government effectiveness measure, they are situated in the <coughs> neighbourhood of countries such as Pakistan, Gabon and Egypt. So they're not well governed countries. Um, and they also have a lot in common socially and politically. They are the two most linguistically diverse countries on Earth. Papua New Guinea uh, is home to over, I think, 800 uh, spoken languages. Solomon Islands has uh, something uh, around 80 spoken languages. And uh, they're both home to literally thousands of different clans, so extra familial units. And clan groups are probably, in both countries, on average, the most cohesive units of collective action um, in both countries' societies. However, clans themselves are not uh, sort of identical. 
uh, there's considerable variation in the nature of sort of uh, clan functioning uh, across the two countries. So in parts of the Papua New Guinea Highlands, for example, clans are often large and relatively cohesive groups, whereas in parts of island Papua New Guinea and also in parts of the Solomon Islands, clans tend to be much smaller and much more fluid. And this is something I'll return to. Then, both countries have very similar electoral politics. Both countries have very high uh, incumbent turnover rates in elections. So in both Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea, at every election, on average, about 50% of members of parliament, parliament lose their seats. Both countries also um, are home to very weak party systems. Parties are fluid, uh, and voters almost never vote along party lines. So uh, it's quite the opposite uh, situation. Well, the situation in Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea is, is almost the opposite from back home in New Zealand, where in the last election in New Zealand, I voted for the Green Party without even knowing the name of the candidate that I was voting for. I just saw the party label, uh, logo and ticked. Right? In Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands, it's the exact opposite. Almost no one votes on the basis of party affiliation, rather they vote on the basis of candidate attributes. Um, and coupled with this, the politics of both countries are very strongly clientelist. So that is, when voters cast their ballot, they vote not in appraisal of the quality of... They, they vote first and foremost on the basis of whether they think the candidate in question will deliver them, or their families, or their communities, some sort of Particularist, particularistic or personalised benefit in exchange for their vote. So they don't appraise how well the government of the day is running the country, they don't vote on the basis of ideology, what they do is they look at the candidate and they think, ah, this person is likely to help me if they get into power, therefore I'm going to vote for them. And reflecting this, when people do win elections in Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea, First and foremost, the, the task they focus on first and foremost during their tenure in power is delivering material assistance to their supporters. So they're very strongly clientless policies. And importantly, as a result of the fact that politics are clientless in, in the two countries and, and the fact that the, part, the party systems are very weak in the two countries, elections are not national races in any meaningful sense. Rather, what you see uh, constituency level contests. Uh, constituency level contests contested by candidates who win on the basis of their ability or perceived ability to deliver patronage to uh, their supporters. So it's a very different situation electorally from that which you see here in Australia, I guess, or which I'm used to back home in New Zealand. So there are a lot of commonal uh, commonalities between the two countries. There are also a few uh, significant differences. Papua New Guinea is a larger country. It has a population of about 7.3 million. Solomon Islands, on the other hand, has a population of about 600,000 people. Uh, and reflecting this, constituencies are larger in Papua New Guinea. The average electoral district in Papua New Guinea uh, in the 2012 election was home to just over 50,000 registered voters. In Solomon Islands, in the 2010 election, the average electoral district had just under 9,000 registered voters. Also, because Papua New Guinea is a larger country and has a larger economy, significantly, um, it's much less aid dependent than Solomon Islands. So in 2012, aid was only 4.43% of gross national income in Papua New Guinea, whereas in Solomon Islands, it was nearly 34% of gross national income. So there are some differences, uh, and there's also a lot in common between the two countries. And perhaps most relevant to the subject matter of this talk, there is one important additional commonality. And that is that, with regards to the running of elections, uh, in both Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea, there is considerable room for improvement. Um, on the Electoral Integrity Project uh, uh, Index, the score for Solomon Islands 2014 elections uh, had the, the country ranked 63 out of 127 countries, which is the score that, by way of reference, puts Solomon Islands in the vicinity of Ghana and Botswana. It's possibly a, a, an overly kind score. We can talk about that more in question time. Um, nevertheless, it's a score that reflects the fact that elections are not run very well in Solomon Islands. What is more, when uh, the Electoral Integrity Project gathers data for the 2017 elections in Papua New Guinea, I think it's very likely 
that uh, Papua New Guinea will score even worse, somewhat worse, most definitely. As I will talk about in some depth in a moment, there are uh, uh, quite a range of problems uh, when it comes to the regions <coughs> of our countries. And they're problems that exist, despite the fact that Australia and New Zealand and another a number of other aid donors have given the two countries a lot of aid uh, under the rubric of assisting with the op operation of elections in recent years. So this gives us one good practical reason to be interested in the operation of elections in Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea. We're trying to help elections be run better in these countries, yet we don't seem to be having a lot of success. Beyond this practical reason, though, there is a good theoretical reason to be interested in elections and electoral quality in Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea. And this is the fact that the problems of electoral quality that we see in these two countries are not perhaps the textbook problems of electoral quality uh, that you may be familiar with from other parts of the world. In particular, in neither country are the problems of electoral quality that are experienced the product of an authoritarian a strong authoritarian state trying to capture at a central level the machinery of elections for the purpose of um, reducing uh, the space in which citizens of the country are free to choose who they might vote for. Similarly, the problems of electoral quality in Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea are not the sort of problems you see in some African countries, with some strongly ethnically polarized African countries where you might see a small number of ethnic groups competing to get their hands on the machinery of elections so that they can exclude rival groups from any opportunity to, to win uh, political power. This isn't uh, what's going on in these two countries. So they're somewhat different cases from your textbook type cases of um, uh, electoral malpractice. And I think that makes them interesting and it also affords us the opportunity to unpack some of the problems um, some of the sort of some of the problems of electoral quality that the two countries experience. Methodologically speaking, they're also quite useful countries. Useful in the sense that for small in, in analysis, there are two country cases which have a lot in common. On the independent variable side of the equation, there's a lot in common. Um, although there are a few variables that do differ. On the dependent variable side of the equation, both between the two countries, within parts of Papua New Guinea, and also between different aspects of the electoral process, there is considerable variation, as I'm about to explain in a second. So this affords quite a lot of analytic leverage for a small n case study type researcher to uh, draw conclusions about what's driving um, the, types of the, the types of problems of electoral quality that we see in the two countries. And it's this analytic leverage, obviously, that I'm going to draw upon in the rest of this talk. So, clearly this talk is about the problems of electoral quality or uh, problems associated with the operation of electrons in Solomon Islands Solomon and Island Papua New Guinea. But before, uh, and there is definitely a lot to lament when it comes to the way these two countries run their elections, but before I go on, I, I do need to uh, note three key positive aspects of the operation of elections in the two Melanesian countries that I'm talking about today. The first of these is that both countries have stayed democratic since they became independent nations uh, in the 1970s, and they've managed a continuous track record of elections over their um, period of independence. So Papua New Guinea has had eight uh, elections since it uh, became independent in the early 1970s. Solomon Islands has held nine elections since it became independent in the late 1970s. What's more, as I alluded to before, uh, in addition to the two countries maintaining a democratic track record, there's, there's not even ever been any sort of obvious centralized attempt on the behalf of political elites to try and capture uh, electoral process or uh, the processes of political power in a way that might make these countries less democratic. It's just not even a clear, visible tendency in the two countries. And beyond that, elections do run in the two countries. Every five years in Papua New Guinea, every, three, every four years in Solomon Islands. And this is quite an achievement itself, given that they're both poor countries, 
they're both very poorly governed countries, and they're both countries where there are significant challenges, logistical challenges associated with election. Uh, infrastructure is poor, we're dealing with remote parts of the Papua New Guinea Highlands, small outer island parts of both countries. Despite this, ballot boxes and ballot papers get out to all the polling stations, they get back, they get counted. So the, the bare bones of elections do occur in both countries, and that's uh, quite an achievement, given that in both countries, it's really quite hard to get anything done, as I learned uh, during, my, uh, during my PhD. Um, all right, so now on to a few more specifics. Well, I've said there are some positive aspects uh, to electoral democracy in the two countries. There are also many issues. And this table is an attempt at sort of summarizing the key issues and also uh, creating a, a typology of sort of two issues I guess, or a taxon taxonomy. And in the table, you'll see each row is a different aspect of the electoral process. And then each column, the columns distinguish Solomon Islands from Papua New Guinea. And then I also have the third column in here, which is an attempt to capture within country variation in Papua New Guinea. The cells in the table are color coded. So cells which are, and the, the colors are slightly different on the OHP than they are on my computer, but cells which are either green or a very pale green, reflect uh, uh, areas where performance is kind of good. Cells that are pink, pink or purple or red, uh, this is a descending scale of badness. Pink's moderately bad, purple's fairly bad, red is atrocious, I guess. And I won't go across every cell uh, one at a time right now, I just want to point out three key features to note. First, on average, Solomon Islands runs elections somewhat better than Papua New Guinea. There's a bit more pale purple and a bit more green here in Solomon Islands than there is in Papua New Guinea. Uh, second, uh, there's considerable within country variance in Papua New Guinea. So most, I guess, in particular, the highlands parts of Papua New Guinea are where the worst problems of electoral performance are to be found. And then also, intriguingly, there's considerable variation in the quality of different aspects of the electoral process in both countries. <coughs> I'll return to this in a second, but one, one point to highlight right here is that while there are problems to do with polling process, electoral role, electoral body administration, the counting process in both countries seems to run quite well. So there's a little puzzle to note now, and it's one that I'll return to throughout the rest of the talk. Quite well, I should emphasize not to say perfect, but uh, quite well. Right, so what's going on? Well, as a first attempt at trying to answer this question, what I, I thought I'd do is uh, take this slide, which is borrowed uh, with her uh, approval from, from Professor Norris, um, borrowed from the talk that she gave at ANU earlier in the year, and it's a slide that is presumably familiar to most of you. It's a slide which shows what she called, well, in its original form shows what she calls the 11 stages of the electoral uh, cycle. I've modified it a bit, um, so I'm relieved to see she's not here. Uh, what I've done is I've removed results, campaign media and campaign finance. We can talk about them later if you want, but they're just, uh, they're not that uh, illuminating for the purpose of my talk. And I've also added in vote buying and uh, voter coercion, because you just can't talk about elections in Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea without discussing these aspects of uh, the choices voters do and don't get to make. I've also reordered the cycle a little bit. Um, and what I'll do now quickly is just take you around the cycle and, and speak to each different aspect of it. Election laws. Neither country has perfect election laws. But um, the laws, the problems of the laws governing elections in both countries are problems born of issues of neglect. So we don't have any real evidence of political elites in either country changing electoral laws to suit themselves. Rather, where the laws are deficient, it's because no one bothered to change them in a way uh, that, you know, uh, in a, bothered to change them in a way that would remedy observed problems with electoral process. Similarly, with electoral boundaries, we see deficiencies, <coughs> deficiencies born of neglect. Particularly, there's a lot of malapportionment in both countries. 
Uh, but generally, that's simply a legacy of the fact that no one's ever bothered to change the electoral boundaries or change the electoral boundaries much from those boundaries that were drawn up by the colonial administrative powers during the colonial era. Um, associated with this, um, so we have an element of neglect, and, and, and we, we don't see any real attempt at trying to redraw boundaries to favour inco uh, incumbent candidates. There's only one example of gerrymandering in either of the two countries that I'm aware of. Likewise, electoral management bodies, these poor uh, entities in both countries struggle, but they struggle foremost because, once again, they are neglected uh, by the political powers that be in both countries. They're underfunded, they're understaffed, staff morale is low, they often want for resources. But, at the same time, the issues are primarily issues of neglect. They're rarely do the staff of electoral management bodies uh, uh, become the victims of coercion or uh, are they pressured in any particular way, as you may see in other countries. Electoral procedures, well, as you might expect, given that your electoral management bodies don't function very well, in both countries, the electoral procedures are, are fairly chaotic. However, the chaos that you see is, um, uh, to borrow an Australian phrase, it's a byproduct of a cock of sort of, it's cock up, not conspiracy, right? Lots of things go wrong, but uh, they go wrong not because there's any sort of central orchestrating power trying to make things go wrong. But they go wrong simply uh, by virtue of the fact that your electoral management bodies are uh, well staffed, at uh, fairly low capacity. Party and candidate registration, just quickly. Uh, once again, not centrally captured in any way. If you want to form an opposition party and go and register it, you can. It, if you're an aspiring candidate and you arrive in Honiara or Port Moresby and you want to register your name to stand in an election, you can. You won't turn up at the uh, electoral management body and, and find someone saying, no, 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 you're from the opposition, you can't stand. On the other hand, um, what you might find is that uh, when you return uh, to your village, uh, someone says, how dare you stand against your uncle? And uh, certainly in parts of Papua New Guinea Highlands, uh, you might find yourself beaten up as a result of that. So there is some coercion uh, associated uh, with people's uh, ability to choose to stand as they might want in elections, but it, it's not an issue of problem, it's not an issue of the centre. It's to do with localised problems and, and problems of power and how it's apportioned at the local level. <coughs> Voter registration, once again, it's not centrally captured in either country. So there's no examples uh, to be found in either Solomon Islands or Papua New Guinea of voter registration, uh, voter rolls being cleared, you know, expunged, the names of opposite members of the opposition party being expunged from the voter roll. Rather, what we see, once again, are problems born of a lot of neglect. The voter rolls are grossly inflated, and part of this inflation is because no one ever gets around to cleaning the names of dead people off them, and uh, things like that. And then there's also a lot of local level cheating that goes on. So when a new role, in both countries, when new roles are compiled or when roles are updated, most enterprising candidates will try and ensure that um, all the kids from their village get registered to vote. Some candidates will bring people in from other constituencies and have them registered to vote. So here, when it comes to voter registration, there's a lot of cheating that goes on, but it's cheating at the local level. It's not any sort of coordinated, central, uh, centralised cheating in any sense. Vote by very common in both countries. The voting process, here we see quite a lot of uh, variation. In parts of Solomon Islands, in, Pap in island Papua New Guinea, uh, the voting process actually runs remarkably well. Polling stations operate as they ought to, people get to vote in secret, and people are usually only allowed to vote once. On the other hand, in other parts of Papua New Guinea, things don't work at all well. There's brazen cheating. Um, there are examples of uh, ballot tampering, ballot box stuffing. There's even a video, uh, um, a quite illustrative video of a, a polling station in the Highlands, which shows um, a lot of dejected looking uh, voters or aspiring voters standing outside a polling station, locked out of the polling station, while on the inside, the agents of a particular candidate are busy filling out their ballot uh, forms on their behalf. So there's considerable variation uh, between different parts of the two countries when it comes to actual the actual quality of the polling process. Then, when it comes to voter coercion, once again, much variation across 
the, the two countries. In both countries, uh, I think almost everywhere, there are quiet forms of voter coercion that go on. Women and young members of families are often expected to vote as they are directed um, by the heads, the male heads of household or of villages. Um, so the sort of quiet coercion is very common. Um, but beyond that, in parts of the Papua New Guinea Highlands, uh, electoral contests often descend into almost out outright warfare. Competing clans will be involved in violent conflict and sometimes tens or even hundreds of people will die uh, within constitu individual constituencies at, at election time. That's pretty depressing, but we can end on a happy note, uh, the same happy note that I ended the last slide on. Despite all this, the counting of ballots in both countries uh, it's a, is quite good. Um, it's something that happens at provincial centres, and this is an important point that I'll return to in a second, um, and it's not perfect, you still find examples of ballot boxes getting burned or vanishing, uh, getting counted twice, but generally um, the counting of ballots in both countries is relatively fair. The final thing I need to do with this slide, of course, is to point out, and this is another addition that I've made that makes uh, uh, Professor Norris's slide look a lot less elegant, alas, but it does highlight an important point. I'm putting an inner circle here, and you can sort of see uh, a pattern, right? Issues that we find uh, to do with centralised parts of the electoral process are first and foremost issues of neglect. On the other hand, problems that are more localised, or it's at the local level that we see our active cheating going on, uh, be it with voter registration, vote buying, vote processes. And then here we have this strange exception of the provincial. Uh, where the one thing that happens at, in provincial capitals, the counting of ballots seems to work quite well. And I can tell you, it's nothing. It's the, the reason for this has got nothing to do with the quality of provincial government in the Solomon Islands or Papua New Guinea. Provincial governments function a lot worse than national government and either governments in either country. So what do I think explains these problems? Um, Here's my explanation. My argument is that the explanation can be found, as I said in the introduction, amongst three interacting political economies. The first of these is a national one. And it's born of the fact that in both countries, uh, both countries' politics are very strongly clientless, as I said earlier on. That means that members of parliament uh, are not appraised by voters on how well they govern the country, but they're appraised by voters on how well they distribute benefits uh, directly, personally, to individual voters, to local level leaders, to communities. And by virtue of this fact, there's not real, really any incentive for members of parliament to pressure uh, or to provide resources for elections to be run better. Um, they're not gonna be punished by angry voters because they, they were unable to improve the quality of elections in a country. That's not really what voters are thinking about. Similarly, no one individual MP is going to be rewarded by grateful voters within their constituency because all of a sudden the electoral management board, some distant entity in the faraway part of the country is running better. Um, so there's just not really any incentive for individual members of parliament to try and get their act together to try and improve the way elections are run in their country. Indeed, if anything, given that sitting members of parliament are powerful political figures, there's actually an incentive to turn a blind eye and to elect, and to elect electoral, the electoral machinery of their countries run down. If anyone's going to benefit from poorly run elections, it's probably sitting members of parliament. And so what we see is a situation where members of parliament really aren't incentivised in any meaningful way to improve the quality of elections uh, in their countries. In fact, they're actually probably incentivized to let things run down. At the same time though, because the countries are so ethnically diverse uh, and so fragmented, and because political parties are so weak, members of parliament aren't in a situation where they can capture the electoral system as a whole at the central level. Um, that sort of collective action just really isn't possible in Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea. And so that means um, 
that, that explains why what we see at the center in these countries, the sort of central problems of electoral administration, are ones of neglect rather than active capture. It's just not possible for any political faction or any group to capture the uh, political apparatus associated with determining how elections are done in the two countries. And by the same token, no one really has to worry about anyone else, their rivals being able to capture the, the um, machinery of elections. And so politicians are by and large disinterested with the quality of elections in their country. Uh, there's a, a process that fosters neglect, or as I call it in the paper, malign neglect. And this goes a long way to explaining the poor quality of the key institutions of uh, the, the, the key elements of the machinery of elections in the two countries. However, what it doesn't explain is why elections do keep running uh, and why, while they're bad and while they're perhaps getting somewhat worse, they're not getting worse at a more rapid rate. Um, and the reason I think that things aren't worse again still is because there's another political economy of, at play. And this is an international political economy where aid donors, primarily Australia, but also other donors such as uh, New Zealand, devote quite a lot of funding to improving the quality of elections in these two countries. And by, uh, they, they provide money, they provide technical assistance, and by virtue of doing this, they get an element of leverage. They're able to put a little bit of weight on political <coughs> actors in the two countries, nudging them in the direction of running elections better. As well, of course, they, you know, provide, able to provide technology and money, uh, which useful resources in terms of actually having elections run. And this definitely has stopped elections from being worse. Uh, you know, has definitely prevented elections from being worse than they already are in these two countries. However, well, uh, alas, my, my skills with Microsoft PowerPoint aren't that good, but um, my intention here was to create a, a circle that was somewhat smaller than this circle, uh, reflecting the fact that um, this international political economy is less important than the national political economy, and there are considerable limits to what aid agencies and, uh, can achieve when it comes to promoting fair quality elections in the two countries. In particular, uh, and specifically in Papua New Guinea, where aid is only a very short, small uh, share of gross national income, there are quite some constraints on what aid actors can do. When push comes to shove, domestic political actors can always say no, go away. Uh, and in Papua New Guinea, even if Australia threatened to withdraw its aid, that wouldn't be such a threat to the government of Papua New Guinea. It's probably more of a threat than Solomon Islands, but uh, nevertheless, domestic actors do have quite a lot of power when push comes to shove and tussles about the quality of election. Well, before push comes to shove, uh, there's also another problem that aid actors face when they're trying to improve the quality of elections in Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea. And this is kind of a problem of visibility. Aid actors are, by their very nature, outside actors. And when you work as an outside actor in another country, it's actually very hard to figure out what's going on, particularly when you're talking about rural parts of uh, these countries a long way from the capital city. All the aid programs are based in, in either Port Moresby or Honiara, and it becomes remarkably difficult to actually figure out um, the sort of mal maleficence, uh, the patterns of maleficence or malpractice that are occurring if you're an outside power um, find to get a, a grasp on just what you're up against. It's difficult because you have to work with local interlocutors who may, may have their own agendas. It's difficult because without a, whole, uh, without a lot of time devoted to study, it's hard to actually get a sense of the political and uh, cultural context that you're working within. And this, I think, impedes aid actors as well. Then, beyond that, there's another uh, challenge that aid uh, faces when it tries to improve elections uh, in Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea. And this is the extent that it works. And, and as I have said before, it does really deliver in some small way. It only works as a countervailing power. That is, it's something there that can offset the tendency towards entropy or decay of the national political economy. But until something changes in the national political economy, 
all it's ever doing is offsetting that tendency to, to decay. And that means that when the aid money is withdrawn or when a particular pro project or program is, is closed down, usually you see the benefits achieved erode fairly rapidly. So for aid to do any good, it has to be there uh, for the long term. And even then, it's constrained in the good that it can do. To be clear, I'm not arguing that aid can't help. Uh, much the opposite. I think that it really has uh, improved uh, the quality of elections in the two countries vis-a-vis -vis the counterfactual world in which there was no aid. But at the same time, there are very real constraints on what aid can do. And then this leads me, leads me to my final political economy. This is the political economy of the local. And here, we have a situation where, because at a central level, the machinery governing or determining the quality of elections is so weak, even taking into account uh, you know, the potential for aid to improve things, there's a lot of space left for local actors to engage in malpractice. And that's something they do with considerable vigor whenever they're afforded the opportunity to do so. Vote buying is very common in both countries because you can get away with it. It's illegal in both countries, but uh, it's not actively policed. The state has very little reach into rural parts of the countries, and it's very hard to prove that anyone bought anyone else's vote. So vote buying is pervasive. Um, and, and that's similar, I guess, with some of the quieter forms of voter coercion that I was talking about. On the other hand, um, so while there's a lot of space for misdeed at the local, misdeed at the local level, born of the problems at the national level, interestingly, at times, we see situations where the balance of power amongst actors at local or more localized levels actually prevents misdeeds from occurring. And the most obvious one, uh, uh, one that I've already touched upon, is to do with the counting of ballots. In both countries, votes are counted at provincial centers and provincial centres, are, provincial capitals are effectively neutral terrain. Um, no one candidate or their supporters can easily dominate a provincial capital in either country. And this means that all candidates can get there to scrutinise or get their agents there to scrutinise the counting process. It also means that people employed in the counting process, what means, so that means that people employed in the counting process there's a degree of vigilance exerted over what they're doing. It also means that they can engage in counting without fear of being, uh, um, uh, you know, without fear for their safety at the hands of the support of any particular candidate. So what we see here is an important, if somewhat accidentally arrived upon balance of power, it's led to an element of the electoral process uh, being undertaken in a much better way than most of the other elements of the electoral process that it sits around. On the other hand, uh, when the local level balance of power is severely skewed, that's where you see your worst examples of electoral malpractice. So in parts of the Papua New Guinea Highlands, for example, where clans are very large, and where, at least in the past, and still to a degree at the present, they would often unite in support of one candidate, often you have a situation where an entire clan will control a polling station. When that happens, this is often where you see the worst uh, sort of violations of um, uh, electoral rules, where you see the most ballot stuffing, where you see uh, voting undertaken by candidates, agents, rather than voters. So, uh, balance of power at the local level, or, no, to summarise, neglect at the political level means that the central mechanisms of electoral quality function very poorly in both countries. And this Poor functioning provides considerable space for local level misdeeds. However, sometimes, uh, however, the extent to which these local level misdeeds occur is um, itself a product of local level balances of power. It's not always a free for all at the local level, despite the problems at the national level. All right, so that's my talk, at least as succinctly as I could put it for now. There's a lot more detail on the paper itself, and uh, there's more I think we could discuss in, uh, over the rest of this session. But to conclude, I have two key takeaway points. First, for theorists, I guess my key point here, I think uh, what I hope the key insight of this paper is, is that local level, or, uh, is that balances of power, or um, political economies as I've called them, matter a lot in determining the quality of elections. Importantly, note 
the plurals in that last sentence. If I were just to conclude that the balance of power mattered or that political economy mattered, I would not be adding much. However, at least in the case of countries such as Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea, what I think I've contributed is the insight that for these types of countries, we should be thinking about how power plays out at a range of levels, enforcing and balancing itself, and we should be thinking about what this means for electoral policy. For aid practitioners, my key point is similar, although with more emphasis on simply highlighting the importance of power and political economy full stop. Uh, there is still a tendency in the aid world, and the world I used to work in, so um, I don't mean to be too critical, but there's still a tendency to think of electoral issues as capacity issues alone. And I would counsel aid actors away from this set of beliefs and encourage them to proactively learn about the ways that political economies impact on electoral policy and then to think carefully about how they themselves fit in amongst this. Then beyond that, also to think carefully about how they might be able to, at various levels, tip the balance of power, a balance of power in favor of better electoral performance whenever they're afforded the chance. Okay, that's enough from me. All right, so thank you very much.